Ned, I've been fascinated, indeed obsessed, by consciousness my entire life, even getting a doctorate in brain science. And I've appreciated your work over the years, and I'd really like to understand your vision of the essence of consciousness, because you've called consciousness a mongrel concept. What do you mean by that? What I mean is that there are different concepts of consciousness, and I don't think you can understand the essence of consciousness without distinguishing among these different concepts. Um, maybe a good place to start is, one, is with one of the traditional conundra, the inverted spectrum hypothesis. The hypothesis that things we both call red look to you the way things we both call green look to me. Um, that looking, what we descri uh, describe using the words looking red and looking green, uh, express the contents of consciousness. In addition to the, um, uh, those contents, there is the awareness of those contents. If you put the contents together with the awareness, you get um, um, the essence of consciousness. Um, the, but in order to really understand what that putting the content together with the awareness comes to, you have to distinguish between consciousness in the sense in which it's the combination of that content and the awareness from anything involving noticing you're, you're in a conscious state or having a thought about your conscious state or reflecting on it or anything like that. Um, so, for example, um, sometimes you um, uh, will be having a conversation and you'll notice at some point in the conversation that there's some background noise, a hum, uh, maybe a fan. Sometimes you notice it when it goes off. Um, but sometimes when you notice it, you also notice that you have been hearing it all along. And you realize that you've been hearing it all along and you haven't noticed it. Sometimes, for example, the, um, you, you made your voice louder to overcome it. Okay, it's that, it's that um, uh, content with the awareness of it that you had before you noticed it that is the essence. So you were having that content all along with the awareness of it, a kind of primitive awareness of it, and then you noticed it. Noticing it added something, maybe it changed the phenomenology, but before you noticed that there was a basic form of consciousness. That's what I think that the neuroscientists who study consciousness are mainly studying or trying to study. Um, and the noticing is something else. It's a big problem in the understanding consciousness is to distinguish that noticing from what came before it, which is the primitive, basic, what I call phenomenal consciousness. So you've talked about uh, um, uh, phenomenal consciousness and you've talked about access consciousness. Uh, right. How do these two articulate with the, uh, the, w the awareness and the content? Okay, so phenomenal consciousness is this basic thing that I'm talking about. Um, in addition, we um, sometimes can report and reason about our conscious states. Um, Freud talked about unconscious states now, he didn't commit himself on whether those unconscious states, maybe states that had been repressed, might have been phenomenally conscious. So his way of thinking in terms of um, the unconscious conscious distinction allowed for a rather strange possibility, which is a phenomenal state that the subject doesn't have access to because yeah. of repression. Yeah. And that, I think, illustrates an important distinction between the phenomenal and cognitive access. Modern neuroscience, I think, dif opinions differ about this, I think, is seeing that we can have very large activations in sensory parts of the brain that don't excite the frontal um, 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 uh, global workspace activations that uh, underlie cognitive access, the kind of access that allows you to report, reason, evaluate, perceptually categorize. So the phenomenal consciousness is this very basic kind of consciousness that doesn't require um, noticing it. Access consciousness brings that phenomenal consciousness into what's some, what is called the global workspace, a space where it's available to all the cognitive apparatus one has. Um, and those are just different things. You've also talked about dividing consciousness in a different way uh, in terms of biological approaches and functional approaches. Yeah. What are those and then how do those overlap in the content and awareness? Okay, I think that the ba this basic primitive biological, um, uh, basic primitive phenomenal consciousness is 
something we share with lower animals, certainly lower <laughs> mammals. Um, we don't know enough about it to know just how low on the phylogenetic scale it goes, but certainly mice. And that's best studied by neuroscience. Um, it's probably, it's nature probably um, is one which in animals with a cortex involves the contents being in the sensory areas of the cortex and the, um, 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 uh, yeah, the yeah. sensory of the cortex in the humans in the back of right. the head. Right. And the, um, um, the, what makes one aware of those contents having to do with a very lower primitive uh, uh, parts of the brain, the brain stem and its relation to the cortex. Um, but the access to it, the cognitive access, is a much higher later function um, that um, is, can be studied to some extent by a computer scientist, uh, people who do artificial intelligence. Um, and so I think there's really a basic difference of approach, even in what sciences these things mm. go in. Mm. The primitive phenomenal consciousness is, a, is really a sm uh, in, smack in the middle of biology. Whereas the more cognitive aspects, like the rest of the cognitive mind, um, can be understood in a more functional, brain-independent way and studied by computer scientists. And, and when you say brain-independent, that means that the, you, you're, you're interested in the function per se. And it doesn't matter the substrate on which it happens. Exactly. It can be a wet piece of meat in our head, or it can be a, yeah. a, a whole array of silicon in a computer. Exactly. We have reason to think that the, those, mm. those functions can be reproduced in different creatures, and there will be no significant mental difference between, the, between what goes on in the different creatures. Whereas for the f primitive phenomenal consciousness, there we have a real problem. We have no reason to think that a computer can have it. That's a very controversial subject, of course. Yes. Uh, let's talk about that because the famous Turing test is put forth that you are very familiar with. You've been a judge in it and you've written on it. And that says what? That says that you can replace the question of whether a machine is conscious by the question of whether a human subject can distinguish the machine from a real person. Um, so this, you know, Turing proposed this. Turing was mesmerized by his own uh, success in replacing questions about um, 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 algorithmic computation with questions of uh, computation by a certain kind of machine that he defined, a, 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 a Turing machine. And so he thought the way to be scientific about any question was to replace it with a more scientific question. The trouble is, as we've discovered empirically, even though, of course, we could have discovered it not empirically, um, the issue of whether people can tell the difference between a machine and a person depends um, uh, inevitably on how much the person knows. If you have a rather naive person, they won't be able to tell the difference between a very simple program, one that just, one of these question answering bots of the sort you can find on the web, <laughs> and a real person. Yeah. And um, um, the other side of it is that uh, someone who knows how, a, a, even if we could make an intelligent machine, someone who knows how it's programmed, uh, uh, would probably be able to tell the difference between it and, uh, and a person. So it, the Turing test fails in both directions. <laughs> I once um, uh, made a, a hypothetical machine, which is um, um, uh, often called the blockhead. If you, there's, an, there's a Wikipedia entry on blockhead. <laughs> I um, read it. <laughs> and, it um, and I have no idea who wrote it, but it's pretty accurate. <laughs> At least the, the one, the, uh, the, those entries are always changing, but the last one I saw. So this was a hypothetical machine that um, uh, had all conversations of a certain length recorded in it. And the idea is that the machine could uh, converse with you um, just as, with a, uh, uh, as well as a person, even though it was just a bunch of, it was just a jukebox. 